Goedemiddag, avond, allen. Um, welkom bij de eerste bijeenkomst van Klimaatnarratieven. Welkom to the first uh, gathering of climate narratives. Uh, today entitled The Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. Just for context, Climate Narratives is a new public series that is initiated by the Society of Arts, the Academie van Kunsten, the AVK, in which artists enter into dialogue with scientists, researchers, lawyers, activists, to propose new imaginaries of climate justice. This first edition of Climate Narratives is co-organized and produced with Framer Framed, platform for contemporary art, visual culture, critical theory and practice in Amsterdam. And our gratitude specifically to Annelies ten Haven, Hans Sitrop of the Academy of Arts, the AVK, and the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, the KNAW, um, as well as to Ashley Maum, Dinara Vasilevskaya, Josin Pietersen, and all of fellow organizers of Framer Framed for all of their organizational efforts. My name is Jonas Staal. I'm an artist, I'm a propaganda researcher. For full transparency, I'm a board member of the Society of Arts, the AVK, but tonight I'm here first and foremost as co-founder and clerk of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, the CICC, that I initiated together with writer, academic lawyer and activist Rada de Souza. Tonight, de Souza and I propose to you a new climate narrative that resulted from the moment where our legal imaginary, through Rada's background and work as lawyer, and my artistic imaginary met. And we want to discuss how we are bringing this new climate narrative into practice. And we hoped to do that with the participation of Dafina Misijan, as well as Linda Steg. Dafina is uh, stuck somewhere nearby Leiden due to a local train um, public infrastructure collapse. And uh, Linda is stuck in Germany because of a logistic train infrastructure collapse. Which means that you are going to spend this evening together with me, Higam Khalidi, as well as the chair of the Society of Arts, uh, artist Lisbeth Bick and Ashley Maum of Framer Freight. Um, our climate narrative, as I said before, is the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. And the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act is an alternative legal framework to prosecute intergenerational climate crimes. And we have applied this Climate Crimes Act in our own court for intergenerational climate crimes, the CICC in Framer Framed Amsterdam between October 28th and 31st, 2021, where we brought together judges, prosecutors, witnesses in public hearings to prosecute climate crimes allegedly committed by the Dutch state and Dutch registered transnational corporations Unilever, ING and Airbus. And we will show you now a short video excerpt that is narrated by Rade de Souza to give you an impression of the court the framework, the space where the intergen Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act has been put into practice. It's about four minutes. This is the court for intergenerational climate crimes. This is the court where pasts, presents and futures assemble. This is the court of human and non-human and other than human comradeship. Outside the court, non-human comrades are declared extinct plants and animals. Inside this court, they assemble as martyrs of the crimes perpetuated by states and transnational corporations. They are our ancestors who sit by our sides, comrades with whom we hold hands, pause, leaves as we charge the corporations and states responsible for the destruction of their worlds and ours. Fossils are present amongst us. For millions of years, our ancestors, animals and plants, lay buried in the recesses of time. Until modern states and corporations violently excavated 
and extracted them to burn our futures. This violence leaves generations of animals, plants, fungi, protists and monorans without resting sites and without life-sustaining inheritances from their ancestors. Humans too assemble at the court. They gather to testify against corporations and states, against ecocidal and racialized crimes committed over multiple generations, against the death form of racial ecocidal capitalism. The humans join their comrades as judges, prosecutors, witnesses and jury to deliver justice to corporations and states for their intergenerational climate crimes. For numerous extinction wars against all species and against time itself. We future ancestors, we accuse we bring evidence of what has been done and what is to be done. For that is the burning question of our movement in a burning world. We testify to violated pasts, presents and futures. And we testify to defiant pasts, presents and futures. We bring evidence of dying worlds and of possible worlds. We testify not only to the violence that has been done to us, we bring evidence of the living worlds, the life forms, the forms of life that could be, that must be, that were and will be. In the presence of all human and non-human comrades gathered at the court for intergenerational climate crimes, we proclaim living worlds, interdependent rights, intergenerational solidarity. We proclaim that regeneration of all life forms is the first principle of a law that constitutes shared comradely ecosystems and must be respected unconditionally to ensure deep futures for all, intergenerational, interdependent, regenerational. So watching um, this video excerpt, you have already heard some key concepts from the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act as we have applied them in this climate, alternative climate court. The emphasis not on rights, but on interdependency, not on individual rights, but on shared ecosystems. The rejection of linear time uh, in favor of equality between past, present and future. It's centering on regeneration, the desire of life to live in this legal imaginary. And of course, the expanded notion of comradeship. Comradeship as a relation, as a political relation that doesn't exist just between humans, but across human, animal, plant, eco shared ecosystems. For further reading on that uh, specific concept of comradeship, you've received this booklet, Comrades in um, Extinction, that also includes uh, a, uh, the extinction ar an extinction archive, extinct animals, extinct plants, um, that perished since the period of, uh, since the colonial period to the present. Um, that makes a point, that, that, that emphasizes a point that Rada and me are trying to make through the court. That is that if we're thinking about the climate crisis, we cannot think of the climate crisis from the industrial period onwards. We have to think from the colonial period uh, as this is the first phase in which we started mass extinction of plants, of animals, due to um, uh, occupation uh, and the theft of uh, land and destruction of ecosystems. So if we're talking about the climate crisis, we are then talking about a crisis 500 years old. For a new climate narrative like the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act to not just be an idea but to become reality, it also means we need to embody it and in order to embody it here we're not in the court now but we are here um, practicing what such an alternative climate narrative can bring uh, we're going to need your 
help. So what I'm going to do is project some of the uh, essential uh, segments from the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. And I will hand out a microphone to go uh, through the room. And our question is to you to share your voice, to lend your voice for a moment to perform this climate narrative collectively, to go through some of its uh, key passages. And with that, we're also asking uh, your consent to proceed this evening, not through the climate narratives that you brought with you, but through this particular climate narrative that we are proposing to you tonight. So that means that we're going to move to the first slide. I'm going to test if this microphone works, and I will ask someone to begin this collective reading. Would you be willing to open and then pass the microphone to the next person? An act to abolish intergenerational climate crimes, to establish intergenerational relationships of solidarity and comradeship among human and human and non-human species. And Act 2 established the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes and proposed measures to remedy the abuse of intergenerational and interspecies relationships in the past by certain persons. Be it enacted by the assembly of all those present in the name of the human and non-human ancestors, Mother Earth and the cosmos, and by the authority of those present in this assembly, in their capacities as the ancestors of future generations. Climate means the conditions necessary for reproduction of every species. Humans means a concept-dependent herd animal that requires pre-existing concepts to negotiate the world around them and has capacities to make judgments and to review, reassess, modify, alter, change, and repudiate individual and collective behavior in a manner that may or may not be in the interests of future generations of humans and or non-humans. Intergenerational includes all past, present, and future generations. For the purposes of this act, it is clarified that A. The term intergenerational is not limited to a single step in the line of descent from ancestor. B. The meaning of a generation is not limited to 30 years or other definitive numbers of years. C. A generation may be of a different length of time for different species. D. Intergenerational relationships include relationships between humans, between non-humans, and between humans and non-human species. Legal entities are legal artifacts established by a group of persons with authority to do so for the purposes of limiting their environmental, social, and legal liabilities and responsibilities arising from their activities. Non-humans means all other species in the past, present, or future that are living, have lived, or will live in the future. It is clarified that non-humans include any natural phenomena like water bodies, including rivers, riverlets, streams, ponds, lakes, seas and oceans, rock formations including mountains, hills, ranges, caves, crevices and such, plant species of any variety and any other life form that is subject to its laws, including birth, death, deterioration, and regeneration. Person means any living being subject to laws of life, in essence, birth, life, death, and regeneration cycles over periods of time as appropriate for each species. 
person does not include a legal person. EI, legal artifacts that are conferred with human attributes by the fear of law. Place-based communities means groups of people who live in a place including a region or area or locality and by virtue of doing so constitute a community. Could I ask you to continue? Place-based communities may differ in size, numbers of people, and or scale of operations. Place-based communities may collectively determine the most effective ways of governing and discharging their responsibilities of guardianship over present and future generations and their nature of managing their communities and their ecology is consistent with the provisions of Section 5 of this Act. An intergenerational climate crime is committed when a group of persons acting as a single legal person engage in acts of commission and or omission or engaged in acts of commission and or omission in the past that harm or harmed, destroy or destroyed, violate or violated, or otherwise adversely impact or impacted the conditions necessary for the reproduction of any species, including but not limited to. Acts of commission and or omission in the past and or present that harm, harmed, destroy, destroyed, violate, violated, or otherwise adversely impact, impacted upon weather patterns in the short or long term. Acts of commission and or omission in the past and or present that harm or harmed, destroyed, destroyed, violate, violated, or otherwise adversely impact, impacted upon weather patterns in an area as a result of which the survival of non-human species become or has become difficult or impossible. Acts of commission and or omission in the past and or present that harm or harmed, destroy or destroyed, violates, violated or otherwise adversely impact or impacted upon relationships of mutual dependence and reciprocity between species or within species, human or non-human, and, um, and or introduce, introduce adver <coughs> adversarial, adversarial relationships between them. Acts of commission and or omission in the past and or present that displaced, displaced people from places, fragment, fragmented, communities and destroyed, destroyed cultures. Penalty, oh. <laughs> Legal persons as defined in section 2.4 who engage or engage in intergenerational climate crimes shall be dissolved and divested of their legal personhood. Upon dissolution of any legal entity, the human persons acting in the name of the legal entity and aiding, abetting and or inciting intergenerational climate crimes under the Act, uh, Section 3 of this Act, shall be automatically divested of their authority to act in the name of that legal person. Such human persons, including managers, executives, officials and other personnel who were at that time at the time of dissolution employed by the legal entity will be eligible to join a place-based community in any place subject to being accepted by the community on such terms and conditions as the community may impose. Upon dissolution, any assets of the legal entity 
shall become social assets and handed over to the place-based community affiliated to the place where the assets are located. Place-based communities may determine how they wish to use, reuse or not use the assets of dissolved legal entities in their places, regions, areas or localities consistent with the principles of ecological and social regeneration and restoration set out in this act. Thank you everyone so much for uh, lending your voice in this collective reading and for collectively carrying the climate narrative that is central to this gathering tonight. Now we continue by presenting to you the first verdict based on the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act that we have just read in the case Comrades Past, Present and Future versus the state of the Netherlands that took place at the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes on October 28, 2021, overseen by judges Sharon H. Venn, Rasigan Maharaj, Nicolas Hildyard, and Rade de Souza. The full verdict you have also received upon entry next to the um, Comrades in Extinction booklet. This particular case was brought to the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes by Bartia Verbeek of the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations, also known as SOMO, who complained that the state of the Netherlands has committed intergenerational crimes against humans and non-humans by developing bilateral trade agreements that were designed to help transnational corporations to expropriate and appropriate natures and cultures around the world. Bartje Verbeek argued how the Dutch state has established itself as a conduit state for transnational corporations and financial institutions. Following the testimony of the prosecutor, we heard witness testimonies, amongst which uh, from Sukherel Dugersuren of the organization OU Tolgoi Watch in Mongolia, who testified that bilateral trade agreements signed between the Dutch state and the state of Mongolia enabled the corporations Rio Tinto and Turquoise Hill resources to mine for copper and gold, leading to life-threatening water scarcity and soil poisoning. The court heard witness Marcela Oliveira of Blue Planet Projects in Bolivia, who testified that the bilateral trade agreement signed between the Dutch state and the state of Bolivia enabled heavy water extraction by Bechtel Corporation, leading to water scarcity for communities in the Cochabamba region. Finally, witness Alfonso Lopez Tejada, president of Acodeco Spat, a Kukama indigenous federation from the Maranon River in Peru, testified that the bilateral trade agreement signed between the Dutch state and the state of Peru resulted in the extraction of fossil fuels by Corporation Plus Petrol, resulting in the destruction of local ecology, including the livelihood of First Nations in the Amazonian regions. Today, the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes will deliver its verdict in public. As I mentioned, all of you received a copy of the verdict upon entry. You can review the entire hearing, including testimonies and evidence of witnesses and the judges. Um, in, um, you can review the entire hearing, comrades, past, present and future versus the state of the Netherlands, as well as witness testimonies, evidence of witnesses, judge examination and the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act in full on the website of Framer Framed in the section Public Hearings Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes. To declare the verdict, I now pass uh, on to writer, academic, lawyer, activist Rade de Souza, author of What's Wrong with Rights, author of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act, co-founder and chairing judge of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure today to announce the verdict on the first hearing that took place on 28th of October. The judgment is before you, and section one of the judgment is about the parties before the court. If you have been to a court and heard cases, you will know that case begins with who are the parties, and section one discusses that. Section two is the charges that were brought before the court, and it has been summarized very briefly by Jonas Stahl. Section three is a summary of the evidence, and if you need the details of the evidence, you can look at it in the website and you will find the entire evidence that is there on, can be for, for viewing on the Frame of Framed website. So sections 13, 11, 12, 13, 14 are summaries of the four witnesses, one prosecutor, three witnesses. Section 15 is the summary of evidence presented by the defense, which is a section we included, but the defense did not appear. So we had to decide what to do. So we thought we would include in the judgment the kind of questions that we would have liked to ask them had they been present. Yeah. What would we have known, asked them? And one of the questions, uh, some of those questions deal with how do they reconcile their role as an administrator and their role as a human being? And this is a contradiction that exists in people who work for large institutions. Where, does, where do I stop being human? And, where, and responsible to my communities and my societies? And where do I enact the role that my job description gives me? So that's the kind of questions we would have liked to ask. Unfortunately, they were not present, so we could not ask them those questions. So I will now move on to part four of the judgment which is on interpretation of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. Now, this is the first case brought under the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act 2021. Interpreting and applying this act to the facts before us without the aid of established rules of statutory interpretation, case law and conventions has involved many challenges. Writing this decision has been a big learning curve for the members of this court. Members of this court are humbled by the trust that the deponents, the members of the jury, and the administrators of this court have bestowed upon them. We had to discuss, decide on questions of terminology in the course of interpreting the act. Questions about terminology so the first question was about using terms like complainant, defendant, prosecutor, accused, which we find in normal courts. This court considered the appropriateness of using terms like complainant, respondent, plaintiff, defendant, and prosecutor, accused. The summons issued to the parties used those standard terms, and during the hearings, the deponents gave evidence were referred to as prosecutors and witnesses. I'm reading from paragraph 16.2.1. But that should not stop this court from asking whether certain terminology used in courts established by the state of the Netherlands should be adopted by this court as a matter of course. Are we going to follow the same term in language that the normal courts follow? In a civil litigation before courts established by states, such as the state of the Netherlands, 
The terms commonly used for those who bring cases to courts is complainant and respondent or plaintiff and defendant. Complainants refers to those who complain to a court about breaches of entitlements, whether under a statutes or contracts. And defendants, the person who refute those entitlements and contractual claims. The four persons who brought their cases to this court are not complaining about breaches of statutory entitlements or breaches of contract that are individual and personal to them. The terminology of prosecutor and accused is typically used in criminal offenses, which are broadly grouped into two classes of crimes, crimes against persons and crimes against property. The deponents in this case do not accuse anyone of bodily harm to themselves or offenses against their personal and or corporate properties. To be a complainant or a plaintiff, the litigant must first concede to the authority of the judge, uh, Dutch legal jurisdiction and the authority of the state to make laws. Those who have brought this case before us claim that states like the state of the Netherlands cannot be allowed to act as the final arbiters of certain matters concerning the futures of species and life on this planet. The question of whether or not the deponents are complainants, defendants or prosecutor accused invites consideration of two further questions. First, what were the natural persons who brought their cases to this court seeking to do? Second, why did they come to this court and not any other court for justice? We address both questions in turn. So the first question about terminology of complainants, accused, etc., is you have to accept the authority of the court and you have to make those claims within the bounds of statutes or contracts in order to be a case. Whereas we say there are certain matters that go beyond the authority of any state, including the state of the Netherlands. And that is about the existence of species and the fate of this planet. The Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes is not a state-centric court. It is neither established by any state nor administered by one. This is a court established by the comrades of the Netherlands, by which we mean those inhabitants of the Netherlands who seek intergenerational justice for all creation. This court is creation-centric. It includes humans, non-humans, and everything else that is part of creation. State-centered courts are established to enforce a regime of rights. Rights create entitlements for right holders. The state determines who is entitled to what and how much. For example, states decide which indigenous people are entitled to land and how much land, and who is entitled to disability benefit and how much. States establish courts to decide disputes about the entitlements that it has apportioned to different social groups under statutes or contracts. The idea of justice in state-centered courts is narrowed down to breaches of statutes or contracts affecting individuals or groups. The remit of a creation-centered court, such as this one, is cognitively wider. Creation-centered courts are established to recognize the life rhythms and life cycles of creation and to direct human species to organize their lives consistently with the principles of interdependency intergenerationality, and regeneration of all creation. Creation does not apportion entitlements to this or that person or group or, this, or to this or that resource or commodity or service. Each creation is endowed with its own properties, its own sensibilities, 
and its own purpose and its own rhythms of life and regeneration. The idea of justice in creation-centered courts, such as this one, is also cognitively wider. Justice in a court such as this one is intergenerational in the sense that everything in creation must be able to exist first and foremost and be able to reproduce the conditions of its existence for the present and future generations. A person bringing a case to a creation-centered court does so not for personal group benefits or to enforce a contract or statute, but they seek some truth about creation that has been lost or forgotten or deliberately discarded and or disrespected or abused. This is exactly what the persons who have knocked at the doors of this court have done. In different ways, from different places, they see that the majesty of creation is forgotten, deliberately discarded, disrespected and abused. They see that the worlds for all creatures, including human beings, destruction and devastation, uh, including human beings, are encroached upon and enclosed by creeping death, destruction and devastation, as stated clearly in the evidence of comrades Dugar Suran, Oliviera, Tejada and Separa in paragraphs 11, 12 and 13. The meaning of crime, I now move on from civil to criminal actions. The meaning of crime in state-centered courts revolves around bodily injuries to individuals or damage to individual or corporate property. The meaning of crime in a creation-centered court revolves around the destruction of the conditions of existence and the conditions for reproduction of life for all creation. It is not limited to what a state chooses to define as a crime. The images of many extinct species were present in this courtroom throughout the hearings as witnesses of past crimes against creation. States are and have always been complicit in the extinction of species on intergenerational scales. A state-centric court cannot be expected to address crimes against creation. For the reasons discussed above, the court finds that those who have brought their cases to this court are truth seekers, not complainants, not accused, not, not uh, respondents, but they are truth seekers. Uh, and not complainants or prosecutors. So the next court goes on to consider uh, why the truth seekers have brought their cases to this court and not to any other. Firstly, this is the only court that is established for the explicit purpose of addressing crimes against creation. We don't know any other court that actually tries crimes against creation. The aims of this court are to abolish intergenerational climate crimes, to establish relationships of solidarity and comradeship amongst all species, and to remedy the abuse of intergenerational relationships in the past by certain persons. I will skip on to the reading of the section. The next one reads, Court section 27A, which we have read already, and go on to section 16.4.3. Secondly, there is no other court that is established to investigate the truth behind legal personhood. All courts, to the best of my knowledge, take legal persons as given. All four truth seekers have brought their cases before us that involve crimes against creation by legal persons, masquerading as real natural persons. We know that as legal artifacts, these artificial and unnatural persons cannot walk, 
talk, make decisions, or execute them. How do these legal, uh, or how do these artificial, unnatural legal persons behave, or take responsibility, or make decisions? Even more importantly, how and why do millions of natural persons around the world have faith in legal persons and believe that they can actually think, feel, and behave like natural persons? Why do they believe this even when they see ever more death and destruction caused by legal persons on a daily basis? These are the truths of our time that need investigation. State-centric courts are adversarial in nature, where the parties must compete to prove or disprove certain facts. Facts are not the same as truth. Indeed, creation's truth is often the casualty in adversarial judicial proceedings. Besides, fact-finding exercises in an adversarial system favor those with money and resources, authority and control over institutions. We heard from Comrade Tejada about the time and money they had to spend to publish reports and facts that everyone knew about, uh, about which they had been complaining for 10 years and no one took notice of. The truth seekers have come out as losers in state-centric courts. They are losers because their adversaries are not real, natural persons that creation has created. Instead, their adversaries are legal persons created by states. In other words, they are artificial entities. We have seen from the evidence we heard from Mongolia, Bolivia, and Peru, and the Netherlands that all four truth seekers have taken their cases to state-centric courts and to court-like consultative mechanisms set up by states and state-like institutions. We saw that neither the transnational corporations and financial institutions nor the state of the Netherlands paid much attention to the truth seekers and their evidence about the abuse of creation. Instead, they corrupted the laws and judicial systems in Mongolia, Bolivia, and Peru and disempowered those states by taking away their economic powers, what Comrade Verbeek called dominium, from their political powers or the imperium. For the aforesaid reasons, this court finds that truth seekers had good reasons for bringing their cases to the CICC and the comrades of the Netherlands. I now go on to talk about the legal personality and, and the problem and interpreting the act on that one. The court had to consider the use of vocabulary developed by state-centric courts and also whether that language has the capacities to communicate the concepts and thinking that inform a creation-centric court such as this one. The language of legal persons and words associated with legal personhood has fostered a way of speaking about artificial legal artifacts as if they are human. The truth seekers in this case spoke about what Rio Tinto, ADT, and Plus Petrol, and what the states of Netherlands, Mongolia, Bolivia, and Peru did or did not do. What international organizations like World Bank, ICSID, and others did or failed to do. Indeed, the members of this court too spoke about legal entities like transnational corporations as if they were human actors. We recognize the difficulties in speaking about legal artifacts in any other way. At the same time, the members of this court also recognize that the act does not recognize legal persons. And we quote section 2427 of the act, which I will skip over. Speaking about legal artifacts like corporations and states as if they were natural persons when the statute explicitly puts them outside the definition of persons requires clarification and explanation. Modern law 
in state-centric, now there's a little bit of legal commentary here, modern law in state-centered legal systems are founded on what is called legal fictions in jurisprudence and legal theory. Lon L. Fuller, a noted scholar in jurisprudence from Harvard University, says this about legal fictions. And I quote, Probably no lawyer would deny that judges and writers on legal topics frequently make statements which they know to be false. These statements are called fictions. Sometimes they take the form of pretenses as obvious and guileless as let's play of children. At other times they assume a more subtle character and effect the entrance into the law under the cover of such grammatical disguises as, quote, the law presumes, or it must be implied, or the plaintiff must be deemed, etc. The influence of legal fiction extends to every department of juris activities. Legal personality, also known as corporate personality, is the foundational legal fiction without which there is no modern law as we know it. The legal fiction of legal corporate personality shapes the institutions of the state and economy. Legal fictions in modern jurisprudence came into existence in the 17th and 18th century when modern states as we know them today were established by European merchants, a section of the European aristocracy, and a section of European intellectuals. Over an extended period of time, for about four centuries now, these groups of natural persons, that is merchants, aristocracies, and intellectuals, established legal persons, and using legal fiats, they continue to establish legal persons and use legal fictions. They accord legal artifacts the status of natural persons, and treat them as such in their social practices. We heard from Comrade Verbeek that special purpose vehicles were set up under Dutch laws as new legal persons, and from Comrade Oliveira about how legal personhood allows them to, quote, migrate, produce more corporate entities as if they were children and grandchildren of the parent entity. State-centered law has bestowed upon legal persons contractual rights, human rights, political rights, rights to organize, and created expectations of, quote, corporate social responsibility and social, moral, and legal, quote, behavior, as if they were human. The idea of human person no longer appears as fiction because modern institutions have embedded their thinking in language, law, institutions, culture, and every aspect of social life. Legal personality was created so that natural persons could use the le artificial legal artifact as a facade to protect themselves from risk, avoid responsibilities for reckless actions, expropriate and appropriate natures and labors, ecologies and communities around the world on a global scale. Natural persons, either individually or in groups, are incapable of, uh, are incapable of death, devastation, and destruction, in the words of Comrade Tejada, on such an intergenerational and international scale without the intervention of legal artifact founded on fictional theories of artificial legal personality. In a creation-centered court, such as this one, law is based on truth and creation and reality at all levels of consciousness. This court does not accept that fictional co concepts can be a foundation for social orders that respects all creation. Yet the members of the court could not have conducted the proceedings without using some state-centric legal vocabulary, even to challenge the conceptual basis for the language. We are of the view that by interpreting the act, applying them to concrete cases, 
as we have done here, and building precedents and case law, it will become possible in the future to develop a language that articulates in more satisfactory ways the needs of all creation and not the profits of legal persons created by state law. Section 17, address, the paragraph 17 addresses the question, has the state of the Netherlands committed intergenerational climate crimes? And that section is based on the evidence and a discussion of the evidence, which I will pass on now and move on to paragraph 18, which is the main court's ruling. Now, this is the court's ruling. It is a crime under the Act to give legal personality to an entity whose purpose is to seek personal and institutional gain at the expense of collective survival of all creation, including humans and non-humans. It is a crime under the Act to conspire with others to subsidize, support, or otherwise give succor through bilateral investment agreements or other means to an entity whose purpose is to seek personal or institutional gain at the expense of the collective means of survival of all comrades, humans and non-humans. By assigning rights to corporations and entering into bilateral investment agreements, the state of the Netherlands has violated and continues to violate the privileges granted by creation to comrades, human and non-human in Bolivia, Mongolia and Peru and elsewhere in the world to exist and to reproduce the conditions necessary for their existence. The state of the Netherlands has breached the trust bestowed upon it by the comrades of the Netherlands by using the lawmaking powers it has inherited to commit intergenerational climate crimes. Now the next is the court's orders that the state of the Netherlands cease and desist from giving legal personality to corporate entities and revokes such recognition as has been already been granted. That the state of the Netherlands cease and desist from entering into bilateral investment agreements that grant privileges and rights to corporate entities and enters into negotiation with other states to revoke such rights as have been granted. And lastly, I come to execution of orders. Court's orders must be executed. That the comrades of the Netherlands and elsewhere use all nonviolent collective means at their disposal to organize to enforce this order. That comrades of the Netherlands and elsewhere use all nonviolent collective means at their disposal to organize autonomous, self-reliant, place-based communities and develop short, medium and long-term plans for the regeneration of ecologies and communities in their areas or regions and re-establish relationships of intergenerational solidarity with human and non-human species guided by the principles set out in sections 6, 7 and 8 of the Act. Thank you. In um, my role as uh, clerk and co-founder of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, we hereby finish the formal declaration of the verdicts and we move on to uh, a conversation, uh, a conversation about the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act as a climate narrative, a conversation about the verdicts that you have just heard, and this conversation with Rade de Souza and all of you will be uh, chaired by Hisham Khalivi, a curator, I would say a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary curator who has worked uh, in Stock, in Leuven, in Lafayette, Anticipations in Paris, chief curator of the Marrakesh Biennial in 2014, amongst others. 
He is the director currently of the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. He was a public jury member at the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes in the case Comrades Past, Present and Future against Airbus. And he is himself the co-initiator of the Intergovernmental Panel on Art and Climate Change, uh, so-called IPAC. Isham, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's on. Thank you. I don't know. Just let me just put this back. Hi. Oh. Here we go. All right. And my coat. So, hi. <laughs> Can I put this up? There's the button to put this up. Amazing. Oh, wow. I love that. Thank you. Well, Welcome, thank you very much, Jonas. Thank you very much, Rada, uh, for reading out the verdict. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Frame of Frame, to Kana V. Afka, Josine Lisbeth, here in front of me. Um, I'm going to improvise a little because we don't have Linda here and we don't have Dafina uh, here. Um, and I prepared in relation also to them. Um, in relation to their work. Um, so I will be improvising and listening to what you have said and spoken about just now of what we have spoken also before uh, the event. Try to um, glue things apart. And I would need your help as well, as public, because we have heard so much and we have our own opinions. And this is a very important moment, a very important situation uh, that we are in. And there are many questions that, um, yeah, that, that go to the realm of what, what culture and art, uh, how art and culture relate to uh, yeah, the idea of legal structures, of legality, of jurisprudence, um, and how we can use culture as an entity in order to foster um, new ideas and change. Uh, whether did this be in a representative state or whether this be to maybe explain how we all are implicated and how everything goes through the lens of culture. We, um, this is something to be discussed amongst us and to see um, what that means. I think I was invited because also at the Jan van Eyck we organize um, and put the climate crisis at the center of what we do. We are uh, a post-academy. Um, we provide space and time to artists and designers from all over the world um, who reside at the Jan van Eyck. And given that these people come from all over, they bring with them a baggage, a baggage um, that are related to conditions of life. They come, they reside, they live, they work, they eat together and with us. And with that, there is also um, an inher inherent um, positioning um, of what positions they start out with and how they come and how we host them. Um, we used to say that at uh, a post-academy such as Jan van Eyck, we treat everyone equal under one roof, which is not totally fair, because we don't always start from the same position. So when we get to um, a place like the Jan van Eyck, and, um, yeah, we have to take account of these uh, unequal positions. Um, most of all, uh, when one thinks of what, um, what are, the, what are the, the, the most important um, tendencies that could say something about what art practice and cultural practice would mean, um, we would say that the climate crisis or all subsequent crises that are stacking are of profound effect um, on, what, on what practice should be and can be. Um, and this is also what we felt as Jan van Eyck that we wanted to put up front to see if we could project ourselves into the future and to see what such academy that hosts people, first of all, it hosts human beings, it hosts um, people prone to context, prone to conditions, what kind of academy we could be in relation to the larger context and, and the conditions in which these 
artists and designers res reside. So in that context, we uh, started out to the Earth Intensive, which is a yearly program. And the Earth Intensive um, tries to um, make that relation between art practice and the climate crisis um, in forms of assembly. And this is possibly why we connect there, because in the last year's Earth Intensive, we, thanks to uh, the idea of Bruno Alves de Almeida, who is our curator, instigated uh, the IPAC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for Art and Climate Change, where we um, asked the question, can culture be part of the assessment, uh, uh, of the assessing of the IPCC, of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change? So in that sense, how do we inscribe culture into the idea of assessment? Um, in this way, um, it looks very much like the CICC, and, um, that we, um, yeah, like a party of the acronyms, as we called it, <laughs> uh, kind of an institu the institutionalization of um, practice. Um, yeah, what, what can art and culture mean in this? Um, I think I am going to start with... asking Rada to, to come forward, and then maybe we can start our discussion. Mm -hmm. And then after the discussion with Rada, um, we will have, well, the discussion with Rada is also with the public, so we're trying to mix it, this is the idea. After that, we will have um, the opportunity as well that Lisbeth will speak um, five minutes, and you can also insert your questions in between if you like. Um, should I go there? Okay, if you want to be yeah, fine. Yeah, okay. just going to take a glass of water. Are you going to? No, thanks. Maybe we help each other. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Well. Um... So the, the Court for Climate Crimes and the Climate Crimes Act are both cultural, artistic and speculative tools uh, that pursue the imagination as a space. Uh, perhaps these are, it's, a, it's a negotiating space in which matters concerning, in this case, climate, environmental and social justice can be thought through. Mm -hmm. um, by presenting the idea of the court, the act, the verdict, uh, terms on loan from natural and international legal structures. You were just also talking about terminology. Um, the institutes involved are the implicated parties, uh, the re representative institutions such as Frame and Framed, the artists involved such as Jonas, your, you as a researcher, um, the public, etc., and the complexities of... And, and then with, this, with these, the complexities of alternative imaginaries can be investigated. So it's like a, a space that we create as a cultural artifact, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, a main question that lingers here is um, what do alternative and speculative climate narratives represent and how do they force change? Um, how do they alter policy making and behavior? So in this sense, how, how do you think, because that's for me sort of a question that hovers above us, is if this is a culture artifact, in fact, we wish it to do something, maybe that it enters. Mm the real world, that it mm. enters the, the, the world where the real legal artifact exists. Mm. How do you negotiate this? How do you navigate this difficulty of the cultural versus the real or the beyond the representative? I think I'll start by saying that these kind of boundaries that we create between what is cultural and what is not cultural is hugely problematic. Mm -hmm. Because in these definitions, you know, uh, is uh, Jonas only an artist and not a thinker in his own right? You know, am I uh, only a thinker with no aesthetics? Mm -hmm. See, these kind of things are difficult. Of course, if you ask me, I can't draw a straight line. But, you know, does that make one, mm -hmm. you know, an artist? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, so you know. I think we have, we have to stop thinking in terms of these categories. Mm -hmm. 
because everything exists in relationships. Exactly. So there is no art possible if there was no society. You have somebody to look at your art and admire it. You know, and in, in my cultural tradition, mm -hmm. for example, singers, musicians, they actually pray that they get a good audience. Because for a musician to have good listeners is so fundamental to their own music, you know, to have a nuance. And there are temples that they actually go to and ask God to give them good listeners, without which they could not be. So I think one needs to start appreciating that there is aesthetics in every human being. Exactly. Yeah. And there is thinking capacity in every human being. Mm -hmm. And therefore, these boundaries are about mutually reinforcing. You get inspiration from, you know, looking at injustice in the world or whatever it is. And they, you feed back through your art, you know, the whole inspiration to continue struggles. Mm -hmm. So it's not such a... A difference. A, a, it, the boundaries are not, mm. you know, as hard and fast as we like them mm. to be or think about them. But do you consider it as a cultural or an artistic artifact? Or do you, do you go beyond that? The, the CICC? Yeah. I would say it's much more than a cultural artifact. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a court and it is a trial. And yes, we, it was hosted by an art institution. And yes, we had all the paintings. And yes, we are play acting. You know, it's like when somebody is uh, playing Hamlet in a theater, you don't jump on the stage and say, hey, you're not Hamlet, you know? So nobody is jumping at me and saying, you know, no, you're not a judge, right? But at the same time, you know, the dialogues and the, and the whole philosophy that, that comes through, especially Shakespeare and plays, it's, it's real. We all go away, you know, feeling something about Hamlet or whatever. So yes, this is in that sense a play. I mean, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's a performance. But what informs that performance is real. Yeah. I mean, we are in a real crisis. Nobody, none of us, and we are all troubled by it at some level or the other, you know, and we all are looking for some answers to find a way out of this. And the whole inspiration for this court at least came from this idea that we were all going round in circles. You know, we were all going round the same laws, we were lo looking out the conceptual world, and we were thinking of the, you know, solutions within that framework. And we felt we had to go back to the basics because that conceptual world in which we live is not working. Mm -hmm. And we needed a platform to say that. And no other platform, I can't go to a court and say, your conceptual world is not working. You know, I cannot do that as a legal practitioner. When I wear my gown mm -hmm. and go to the court, I talk about, you know, how great the Constitution is. I mean, I have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, it is not working. We know that. But that's great. So you accept the conditions that you are in and you make use of it even. No, but this is stepping out of Enlarging your that. prospects. This is stepping out of the legal con yeah, exactly. uh, the discipline yeah. because art allows that space. But I'm sure there are many artists who feel very suffocated by the art establishment. Exactly. Yeah. And they are looking for somewhere else to step out so that, you know, he's <laughs> laughing that he can, he can come and, you know, say that. I agree, yes. But even then, it's super interesting to see that um, the courts themselves are products of imagination, that the legal system itself is a product of imagination, that it's culturally mediated. So in that sense, it's almost like a way out for us as cultural practitioners. Well, I Not be bound by, by the, the threshold of representation in that sense. I don't think that courts are a cultural uh, thing. They may be informed by culture. But whose culture? And that is why this, in this judgment, mm. we say clearly that in the 17th, 18th century, some European merchants, a section of the aristocracy and a section of the intellectuals came together and established this. This is their imaginary. Mm -hmm. You know, the European peasants were out of this imaginary. They were all evicted from their land. That's why they went to the United States and North America and wherever else, because they were evicted from their land. 
And that is how you have cities and slums and, you know, mm -hmm, all the mm -hmm. industrial revolution stories. So it's not they who established it. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is an imaginary of the merchants. Mm -hmm. And what we are saying is that the merchants' imaginary has brought us devastation and death. And we need to step out of being merchant ourselves mm -hmm. in our thinking, just because we have been educated in that way, and start thinking in a non-mercantile way not have everything having quid pro quo and, you know, what I call the accountancy logic to everything. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's interesting to tap into this because um, th there's a lot of things that relate also to our practices um, also at the academy and where we are also looking more and more into moving away from the concept of individuation uh, towards communality, commonality and relationality. Um, and, and that we have thresholds that keep us away from these ideas such as um, autonomy within arts practice or political neutrality. But also, if you look at contemporary political society at large, the idea of entitlement, you were talking about it just now. Um, entitlement seems to be connected to the idea of ownership instead of owing mm. something or mm. someone and being indebted. So it can also mean accountability or liability which is nice if you connect it to litigation. Um, these words give us a good start to work with when it comes to attribution of rights. Um, is this not counterintuitive that we attribute right to a river or a land, where this right is not the idea of being in debt of the river, that the river wants something back from us, but we are indebted, we are in relation to the river. We need to give back what we take. So the question here. Is it in any way possible to find a way out uh, in, in this legal framework that is not made for this? Uh, so the, the, the existing legal framework does not, cannot account for what we are speaking about, the communal, uh, beyond the individuation. Um, is, is there such a thing as communal rights, environmental rights, or communal indebtedness or environmental indebtedness? Yeah, I think you've touched on a very basic premise for the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, which is on the very idea of rights. And uh, the idea of rights is closely associated to contracts. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And as I said, for a merchant, contract is the single most important thing. There's nothing that is more important to a merchant than contract. Because everything has to be, you know, what you're buying, what you're selling, how much are you going to give me, when will you deliver. These are the kind of things that... And rights create a right bearer, so somebody who has something to give, and a person who can receive that, who's entitled to receive it. Yeah? And this is the language, the grammar, not the, the grammar of contracts. And rights are central to that. Without rights, there is no contract. And as I, I talked about the mercantile imaginary becoming the social imaginary, mm -hmm. and this ha starts to happen around the 17th, 18th century, when rights then become, you know, the metaphor of a whole, for a whole social order. And I think what this does is it objectifies things. You, everything has to become land. Mm -hmm. Land is something we exist on. It's a condition of our existence. But what rights does is it turns land into property. Exactly. Yeah? It turns nature into property. It turns human beings into labor force, which we then sell in the labor market. And we all the time worry, how is this going to, how is Brexit going to affect labor market? Not your problem, ours. But still, you know, you, you get my point. But it is, it is still, and, and therefore everything gets objectified because if it is not objectified, it can't be bought and sold. So it is fundamental to a mercantile logic. And that is why you have philosophers like John Locke who come out and talk about the social contract. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, who sat around the you know, table and wrote a social contract? It was a mercantile metaphor, right? And they established the states or what we call the modern state. 
because they were not happy with the feudal states. They established this. And that was a rights-based state. And this state was based on rights, but it evicted people from land. You know, the enclosure movements in Britain and, mm -hmm. you know, Danish peasants, German peasants, everywhere. They were, people were thrown out of land. Slaves, slave trading, forcibly removed. That is how rights were established. And you cannot overlook that and just look at the normative promise that it makes mm -hmm. and say that this is... So I would say that, you know, coming back to your question of is there a way of mediating it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is this like asking a merchant, can you give something to me free? Yes, he, they will give you something free once, twice, yeah? But even when a merchant gives free, they want a tax relief for that. Even when a merchant gives free to God, then they want something back, you know, give me more profits next year so that I can... So there is always that give and take. What, what we are saying is that way of living has brought us to a brink of extinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to pull back from that me mentality. Mm -hmm. So let's get out of that whole language of rights. Nature does not give anybody rights. It does not entitle you to anything. The air is there, you breathe it. The water is there, you drink it. You drink what you need. Human species sits on the top of the food chain. You know? And I'm reminded of an opening line in the Rig Veda, which is supposed to be one of the oldest Vedic texts. I'm sorry, this is culturally completely alien to all of you. But the opening line of the Rig Veda is, life lives on life. And that's the first ecological principle. If life lives on life, then life has to safeguard life because otherwise there will be nothing to live on. And because human beings sit on top of the food chain, it becomes our duty and our obligation to let all life live so that we can live. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole property mentality and the rights regime has come, oh, we will cut a little bit of forest, but we hear what you're saying about environment, but, you know, we will keep a little bit, we'll plant some extra trees, which is never going to be the same tea trees that were destroyed to build railway sleepers, or which is not never going to be the same. They take 800 years, 900 years to grow. Exactly, so, yeah. You know, so that logic doesn't work. But that, that suppose, what, what is your proposition in that, that, you have to break apart that system first and build it anew. Yes. This is what I'm hearing. That is why we got yeah. talked about place-based communities. Exactly. And creation mm. at the heart instead yeah. of states. Yes. Exactly. Um, would, you, would you have an idea of how to bring this idea of Owen, which you find in decolonial theory, uh, from Owen to Owen? Would you have an idea of how to bring forth this relationship that we have within this new paradigm? And are we using social imaginaries for that? Because we are not yet ready to break apart that structure. I won't say we are not ready. What I will say is we are ready, but we don't know how to. Mm -hmm. You know, I think last vast majority of people realize that something is fundamentally wrong. And this, I wouldn't be exaggerating when I say this. In the global south, which is the third world, which I always say is two-thirds of the world, people know this. And they have tried many things, right? People here, are they know that something is not working. But I think the conversation needs to move to... You know, and, and people have tried trying to make the existing system work. They have gone to the states, they have gone to the law courts, they have protested, they have marched, they have done all kinds of things within that. But then we come back to where we started. And that is where I think, I mean, you know, in Global South, you know, third world countries, mm -hmm. we had national liberation movements, anti-colonial, these were big things, you know, very big things. In, in things, um, you know, one can go back to history, all the socialist mm -hmm. struggles, they all try to do something that out of it. But I think the question is, we need the spaces to be able to stand back and review what we have done so far, and to be able to reassess, where do we go from here? 
and increasingly those spaces are being shut out. You know, for example, universities in the post-war era were kind of a liberal space where you got place where there were a lot of uh, you know radical, critical, intellectuals, thinkers. With now neoliberalization of universities, those places are closed. You know, so all social spaces, meeting places, we don't have places to meet. So this is where we start. Yeah. So you need to find. You know, <coughs> we had to find frame of frame so we could talk. <laughs> You know, I mean, this is what is happening. Otherwise, there was a time when churches, mosques, you could just have a meeting there. You can't meet people anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is becoming a crisis. And this is what is stopping us from, I think, asking those basic questions. What can we do? Why have we, you know, what have we done well? What have we not done so well? What are the things that need to be reviewed and reassessed? And as community, human communities, this is a central part of human existence. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why communities are so central to human life, because mm -hmm. we are a herd animal, as the, mm -hmm. as the act says. And for us, we have to gather as a herd to be able to see this is not taking us to a good place. Exactly. And isn't there a difference between... Um, the idea of coalition building in the 60s, pan-Africanism and all these things that happened, and now, where we have urgency and collapse as wind in our backs, isn't, isn't there a difference? Um, the, there is always a difference, because we, we do certain things, and we get some things wrong, and some things, you know, don't work. So the national liberation movements were big moments, mm -hmm. yeah? They tried self-determination, which is still a fundamental issue, but they thought that by forming another state that somehow, you know, we could get rid of whatever the problems were. But then their state started looking exactly like the colonial states that they disposed of. Mm -hmm. People here, you know, in the, in, in, uh, the uh, Western countries tried for socialist struggles and they thought socialism was a great thing. It was good. And there were big major movements. It, it has shaped the post-war generation and the post-war world in clear ways. But then things went in a different direction. So now is the time for us to sit back and think, you know, what, what is this, what is good about this? So there are some people who throw the baby with the bathwater, mm -hmm. and there are some people who don't want to throw the baby, so keep in the dirty bathwater. We don't need both those situations. Mm -hmm. And that requires us to rethink our, challenge our own imaginaries. Because we have to challenge ourselves. What does self-determination mean in this context if you cannot get clean water? You know, what does self-determination mean if people have to sleep on the streets? And, and this is what, you know, we need to come back to. Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe I'll take it. Yes, we have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I... I think there's um, a lot of people who uh, are um, driven by stability. They want to have um, a world that can be predictable. <coughs> they they uh, like the, law, the, the language of law. And you have another part of people who, want, who are curious, who want to change, and who yeah, maybe uh, like the language of art. And here you combine these two. And... Um, well, um, I, I meet a lot of um, uh, strategic ignorance. People don't want to hear about the disasters. And the more disasters you have, the more fear there is. The more people want to have more law, more predictability, stronger leaders. So um, <clears throat> in one way, you, you address um, the language of law here. Is it, My question is, um, can... can the combination of art and law also uh, inspire people to dare and be curious. Uh, maybe it's a fuzzy question, but I hope you understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not a fuzzy question at all. In, on the contrary, you know, uh, it is. A, you need, you know, those kind of coming together to be able to transcend. You know, and to create new imaginaries, one of the purposes of doing this court was to expand and to stretch our imaginaries. And that was the main purpose. Yeah? So, and this is a way of stretching it. 
and, and by you know, showing how limiting what you think is stability in the law. The law is actually creating instability. You know, all the stock market rules that they are you know, forming, they're totally, you know, it, it is an established, uh, you know, uh, the deregulation things, you know, all the financial hedge funds. And they call it, it is we, the non-economists, the artists who think that law is stability. But if you talk to Bill Gates, for example, he's calling, he's talking about creative destruction, you know, as, as the whole, because that's what the markets are all about. This will of the market, it's the most unpredictable thing. Mm -hmm. But we are willing to believe that the law that establishes those hedge funds and those derivatives and all those kind of things, which plays with our pension funds, which plays with our sc children's school funding, we are willing to believe that that is stability. But, you know, when we start saying that, uh, you know, this is not working, we think that, oh, this art is disrupting. Art is not disrupting. Their art is doing much less disruption than the hedge funds and the, and the derivative of, you know, and, and Wall Street. But, but it is a matter of view. And um, what would you say to the Forum for Democracy people if they vote for that and they want to have the tribunal, for instance? We spoke about it. Huh? If on one side, we have here the, the climate court, which is an imaginary, uh, let's say, social imaginary. On the other side, we have the tribunal, which is the same, right? The, the, it seems to be a struggle or a culture clash or, or a war that is instigated where culture plays the part, eh? the, 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 the role. Um, how would you are, you... are you referring to like people's tribunals, Russell Tribunal and that... Well, I'm referring to, to, to right-wing views in which they feel that um, any attempt to subvert uh, the existing system, the mercantile system, let's say, Huh? Mm. The neo-capitalist system mm. is, in fact, um, an injustice to them, right? Mm. You can flip the coin almost. Mm. And how do we account for all of us as a humanity with our different opinions and our different starting points and our difference? How do we do that? Because from our point of view as cultural practitioners, this seems to be logical. I mean, look at the nitrogen debate right now. Huh? The FIFA day just... Um, yeah, you want to ask a question? Just one second. The FIFA day just, um, in their party meeting, um, rejected one of the propositions um, yeah, for, for nitrogen. For, sorry? For the... For, for the, for the um, um, t yeah. For the reduction of nitrogen in this country, because we produce a lot of nitrogen, nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah, because of the state of our mm. agriculture. Mm. Um, it was rejected by the Liberals, um, 51 mm. to 49. Mm. This is huge, in fact. Mm. So I think the question of stability, and this is the same, that if we were to uh, address the issues that we have, we need to do that Communally, all of us. Yes. How do we address the different opinions and the difference? Well, obviously we need to do it collectively. Nothing is possible, and this is where we are collective beings. We are, you know, we, and that is where the question of intellectual exchanges, questions of arguments. Exactly. The first thing I would say is don't be afraid of an argument. You know, I mean, because... It is good that we have multiple views and things. It is good that we are able to sit around and we are able to come because ideas only grow. Knowledge is a social creation and it only grows when we interact with each other, when we, you know, when we talk to each other, when we challenge each other. And that is how it develops and grows. And we should not suffocate it. We should let it grow. Mm -hmm. The key thing is to always identify what are your basic values. Yeah. In this court, we have said that the basic values are, first, we should be able to exist, and we should allow everything to exist. And that means anything that 
does not allow us to reproduce the conditions of life is a crime. Mm -hmm. So if you start with that, a basic premise like that, other things we can argue. We can argue about, you know, what you should do in this election or that election. Those are very small matters compared to the level and the extent of the, uh, you know, the, the conceptual crisis that we are facing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would you like to pose the question? A couple, of, a couple of weeks ago I had a presentation about an architect and he was flying around the world and he was learning about... Uh, in Heemse stammen, indigenous, indigenous yeah. communities. Communities. What will happen if we bring the people to this this kind of place in the in the, the, the rich part of the world when they come to the Hague and we put them on the at the uh, at the um, uh, into the power of the of the of the, of the government? What will, how do they look to our society? How we live? How we do? How we act? How we everything? And how do they do act live? And what can we learn from them? And what will happen if we put them here in the, into the power? Mm. Um, I don't think that putting anyone into power, you know, is, is really taking us anywhere. Because we all exist in our own spaces. See, the problem now is not that... Of course, we have a lot to learn from each other, you know. And we have a lot to learn from indigenous people. I would say especially in the context of climate crimes because they know the basics and they've still held on to the basics. They too have a lot to learn from you. All this dazzling technology. I was so dazzled by this lectern today. <laughs> it just goes up. I mean, it's fabulous, you know. Don't get me wrong. But we all have to learn from each other. But the point is not to put anybody anywhere. This entire problem has come because of highly centralized governance of economies, of states, and it is getting more and more and more centralized, you know, and more and more distant, therefore, from actual real people. And that is the problem with corporations and states, because they exist, and as we said in the judgment, that this level of ecological destruction could not happen if there were not centralized institutions like corporations and states. Because how many, you know, even if all Dutch people were bad people and did bad things, and they did it through, as individuals, they cannot bring this level of destruction. Mm -hmm. It remains localized, you know. I mean, you take a simple thing. It's not like, uh, you know, there were no foot and mouth or animal diseases or whatever. But now you get bird flu, the whole world suffers from that. Mm -hmm. And that level of centralization is a problem. And the problem is therefore not to put anyone anywhere, on the contrary, to descale these institutions so that local people have greater control over their lives and over their ecologies and over their communities. And it is this scaling down that we need to, not scaling up by bringing an indigenous person and putting them into those institutions, the institutions remain as they are. Mm -hmm. And we have tried this. Anti-colonial movements were about this. We kicked out, you know, the British. We put our own Nehru's and Gandhi's there. And what did they do? They did exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not about putting people there. It is about looking at the institutions and seeing how can we bring, build institutions that remain close to real people and real natural world, whatever is that. That is the challenge. So I, I have a thing about, you know, keeping the institutions as they are and just changing the faces mm -hmm. at the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if I have understood your question correctly. We have a chance to do a, a, a small round of questions. Okay. Uh, to slowly, we will have to... That's fine. It's closing. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation again. I wanted to ask you a question about the legal person issue, because it cle it's clearly also from your court order 19.1 that it seems to imply that all the legal persons uh, should be disbanded. So I wanted to know, is that your position, that like the whole concept of legal person itself should be done away with? 
Uh, and the second question I have is about the community, because like the legal person, it in involves like a kind of a collective with a supposed will, uh, huh? your place-based community. So I was wondering if like uh, the, um, so my first question being, should we like disband all these legal persons? Second question is, does the community somehow replace the legal person in a sense right. of a kind of a mm -hmm. basic legal yeah. unity? Yeah, 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 good, good, good. Very basic questions. Thank you for those questions. Uh, as far as the legal personhood is concerned, I think one must recognize, I mean, historically, uh, if anybody is into going to tell, I mean, I'm always, uh, of, uh, you know, um, fearful of talking about some of these things because then we have to get into the entire European history. You can say mm -hmm. before modernity, there were legal persons. Churches were legal persons. Universities were legal persons. Your uh, guilds were legal persons. So why not this kind of thing, etc. And But... There is a marked shift with modernity, and that is why I keep coming back to it is not, you know, but modernity creates legal persons on the basis of fiction. The old legal person, I don't know if we can bring it back again. I don't think we can bring back the Catholic Church to what it was before, you know, or those medieval universities, because that was another time and another thing. So, but Modern legal persons, which includes states, which includes corporations, they are based on fiction. And anything that is, if you have a social order that is based on fictions, it cannot deliver you the truth. And the truth of our situation today, in our historical conjuncture, is that we are heading to a disaster. An ecological disaster, a nuclear disaster, you know, everything is staring, an economic disaster, you don't know what Wall Street will do next. And you can be left without your pension after working 50 years of your life. This is the disaster that stares at us. So this is because it, our social order is based on a fiction. And what we are saying is let's move away from this fictional social order. Mm. And so therefore the answer is yes, all legal persons are problematic. Yeah? modern legal persons, without going into the ancient ones. Now, to your next question on place-based communities. Yeah? I think place-based communities because place is where the bonding between nature and people takes place. Mm -hmm. You live in a place, you are familiar with your river. Your river is not the same as mine. You know, my river runs only for... Uh, three months in a year, you know, uh, it rains. Uh, three months in a year, it's dry. Because I come from arid, sub your river runs all through the year. You know, your, you get rain all through the year. We get rain three months in a year, and we live on that for six, 12 months in a year. So your river is different from mine. Your mountains are different. We don't have snow in our mountains. You have snow in your mountains, you know. So I don't want to stretch the analogy. But that is, the, that is the relationship that you need to form with your nature and your environment and ask how you can put your labor, whether they are black people, white people, brown people living, that is inconsequential because they too will have to form bonds with that, whatever the nature environment that you're living in. And therefore, I say, therefore, place has to come back to central focus if you want to shift away from, you know, this, this. Otherwise, you are, the, uh, you know, building. And the whole logic of these institutions, whether they are corporations or states, is to deplace ourselves, to evict people from land and then put them into institutions, mm -hmm. to take away your land and then to say, oh, now we can give you a job in a factory. You know, this is the process of displacement and emplacement. And this has gone on for a long time. And that is why there is constant instability. And that is why I think bringing back place-based community, of course, it's a very elementary concept here. I mean, at the end of the day, this is an art project. But hopefully it triggers something imaginative. Mm -hmm. Would it have a legal unity? Would it have like a legal, would it be like a legal entity? 
I don't think you would need legal entity. If you know everybody who's living in your neighborhood, <laughs> you don't need a legal entity. You know, or you may form rules, but that will be a negotiated rule, and we don't know what shape and form that will take. Yeah? For example, in, in Asia, across Asia, yeah, in the pre-colonial times, we had what were called the village economies. Yeah? And villages were sub the basic social unit. For example, taxation was ta a village can be taxed, not an individual. Yeah, that was a system. Sociologists now look at it and they call call it the village republics. Maybe that re village republic model we can bring back because we still have living memories of that. M but you need to. Uh, I can't say what kind of place-based communities you can bring back. But we all have to look back into our histories, our cultures, learn from each other. Maybe you can have look at our, you know, village republics and see if you can replicate or learn something from us. Or you know, it, 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 this is this is a process that has to. But we need to first recognize the primacy of place, because that is where human relations to environment is formed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed the, the evening so far, and I have great admiration for Jonas Tau and your um, very bold piece of art. I'm a lawyer myself, so I take this very serious as a legal proposal. So I, will, I would also like you, I actually have like 10, I think 30 questions, but I will limit myself. Um, so the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Court is based on a nonlinear uh, concept of time, but, and, but I'm very much wondering about the remedies. So the remedy is to dissolve legal persons, and I would think that that is a forward-looking remedy, or at least it, it applies from now on. So I'm wondering, is there space for mourning also about those yeah. species that have, have gone extinct? Because I think that is also very much one of the inspirations of your project. And if I take seriously what the, this court would do, I think the charges would apply to almost every uh, multinational corporation, perhaps to every state. So it would dissolve all those entities, which would in effect mean that we totally disrupt the existing social order. I think it might, that might probably also be the reason that you chose this word comrade, which has this communist, communist <laughs> revolution kind of uh, association. So. And then this brings me to my final question. So if that is the ultimate goal, and I think that is the consequence of this court, why was there not in the order of the court um, the dissolution of the state? Because the state is, of course, also a legal person, at least according to Dutch law. Yeah, yeah. OK, that's, a, that's really a very good, uh, very good question. Because we did have to consider this. I mean, the judges did consider you know, on the question, because we do define the state as a legal personality, and we do define the modern state in a certain way, and so on. But at the same time, the state's powers are inherited from its history. You know, the state is not really, a, it's a historical inheritance, and it has powers to do certain things, but what we are saying is that it has abused the powers that it has inherited from history to then support and create these legal persons and so on. And therefore, the question of, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one, and I will concede that question straight away, because the core driving energy for this place-based community is self-determination. Mm -hmm. yeah? Self-determination, we decide what we want our destinies to be. And if that is the determination, then it is possible that the state as an institution will transform. Possible, not necessary. It is possible that it will be so totally aligned that it becomes like a super fascist state because if people rise up, then there is going to be a response. Yeah, Police powers, military powers, all those. And if that happens, People may be forced to re reconstitute or rethink or reimagine these kind of institutional structures. We don't know. 
And so all I can say at this point is we need to be open to new institutions evolving from our struggles, whether that will be, and maybe in some states, because the socialist revolutions were about states, right? They thought, get rid of all these capitalist blocks, and then we get out the get hold of the state, and then the state will start serving the people. But that didn't happen. But the idea is still there that, you know, somehow you get rid of these people and we can have a better society. And of course, the environment was not there, and women were kind of marginally there, a little bit, not so much. But you know, that, that was the kind of, world, kind of world we are coming from. So the state is an interesting institution in that sense. The merchants usurped the old state, the feudal state that existed. And it was the merchants who transformed that whole feudal state by giving shares to the kings, by you know, various other means, and I won't go into the history of how corporate power, East India Company or Dutch East India Company, all those things change the character of the state. So that means that can we also change the character of the state? We cannot say that definitively. It may change, it may not change. But rest assured that if we say that corporate personality is abolished, the state is going to be finished anyway. Mm -hmm. Because the power of the state as it exists today comes from those corporations. I mean, look at the American election money funding lobbying. You know, the kind of, now where would they be if they just had to fight as, you know, individual, honest individuals instead of getting all this corporate money from and the corporate lobbying that goes on. I mean, that, that, but we need to also then be willing to accept that the state as it exists today is totally corrupted as an institution, because it is set up with lobbyists and PR and, you know, all those kind of, and revolving doors which go, individuals who go from, you know, the state to the corporation, come back to the state, they're there, they establish the institutions. And we have dealt with some of that in the evidence here. Yeah. So, What do you think in relation to this dissolvement? Yeah. yeah, no, I, I think it's terrifying. Okay. To, so I, I think there's a lot of, so the whole, well, <laughs> the self-determination is of course also one of the core um, goals of a democracy. And I, so I studied um, how court decisions change society. And I think courts are usually, I, th I think the proposal is in many ways fantastic. I think it should be achieved by politics, not by a court. I understand you chose a court. I have to think more about this. So okay. yeah, this yeah. is not my definitive okay. answer. Yeah. No, it should be changed it's about politics. There is no, that's why the court says go and organize. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how you execute the order. Go and organize collectively. It, so, you know, it is, yes, it is a performance here, but what it's asking you to do is to go and organize. Exactly. I think we need to round off. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Lada. Thank you. Um, but not before the final two invited respondents, but maybe you will want to respond. Yourself. <laughs> the very, very last response to the respondents. We have two respondents. Uh, Ashley Maum from uh, Framer Frames, who's also part of the research team and built the Extinction, Extinction Archive that was just referenced and on, of which you see some of the images that provide the vast 500-year evidence of intergenerational climate crimes. There are two options, Ashley, you can speak from the people with this microphone or you can join behind this wonderful lectern for final statements and thoughts. That's nice. <laughs> from the people. Um, yeah, so as Yona said, I was uh, one of the researchers working on the CICC, and for that I had really the privilege to, uh, and also or? in my roles uh, working at Framer Framed, uh, and I had the privilege of <laughs> uh, diving into the research on this Comrades in Extinction catalog. And one element that I worked really hard on was the where we go through the threats that made these species extinct, which is essentially quotes from researchers on what caused their extinction. 
And something that's really stayed with me is that one of these, one of these quotes I found to read uh, just simply, this species extinction was forecast since its discovery. Uh, which I think in that we can find a very upsetting resignation to a certain climate narrative, to certain narratives of power. Um, and so I think what was sort of expected for me from working on this project and uh, probably also expected for everyone here from this verdict and from sort of cultural practi practitioners and artists who want to change things. And I think what we see in this act is a lot of uh, desire to change society and to change our modern institutions very radically. Um, but something I wasn't expecting was this change of terminologies, the section on the truth seekers, which probably isn't very important to everyone else here, but as someone who worked in the court, I know that we called these people prosecutors, witnesses, judges, which I think we are maintaining. Uh, so this is a very small point in the verdict, which I think is actually very meaningful because it shows a, a vulnerability within the court to admit a sort of misstep in something that we did ourselves in calling these people witnesses and prosecutors and uh, an ability to, to, change, to change narrative. Um, so I think that's something that was unexpected for me in, in, the, in the act and that came, or in the verdict. Uh, but that shows a, a really important element of the people who are working behind the court. Um, and I think that just to stress that I think that's something that the court should uh, maintain. But also it does offer a sort of note for all of us that uh, this ability to think self-reflexively and change and just to do that without being so scared for looking wrong. Oh, I've been cut off. <laughs> Yeah, but that's what I want to say, which is, of course, what we need people in power to do. So I think it's good that the CICC does it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Elisabeth Beek is the second respondent, artist, part of the duo Big van der Poel, but also the chair of the Academy of Arts, Society of Arts, apologies, AVK, Academie van Kunsten, and thus legally obliged to stand behind this specific lectern. <laughs> in um, <laughs> providing her response. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jonas. Dear Rada, uh, Hisham, Jonas, uh, Ashley, and dear public, um, this is by no means a conclusion. I think what we are doing here is uh, planting seeds, and I feel actually very humbled by so much eloquence, Rada, and also by the questions from the public. So this is even by no means a response, I would say, because uh, I feel... Uh, maybe not equipped yet completely, but I will try to say something that I prepared and that I think should be said and maybe it repeats some of it of what has been said already by you and also by your questioning and so on. So there's really something going on when it is 45 degrees warmer in Antarctica than ever before. Around the world, we are affected by pandemics, climate crises, wars, injustice and inequality, theft of private data, dissemination of false information, streams of ref refugees fleeing war and desertification. And this is going to be more and more and more, I would say. Global capitalism leads to significant losses for citizens and a loss of rights all over the world. The struggle over definitions and implementation of democracy, and this is, I think, very important also in the context of this court, is symptomatic of the sometimes dramatic changes in the character of public life. These disruptions, disruptions show how urgent the question of the public has become. Our conflicts have major consequences for the ecosystem of which we are all part. The message of the 2022 IPPC report is very clear. Climate change already poses great risks. For the time being, we here might think far from our bed. But these risks affect ecosystem and people and disproportionately affect the most vulnerable in the climate hotspots. And you referred already to that in the global south. The burden on these areas and their inhabitants, who are mainly in the global south, as I said, is disproportionate. We are colonizing the future their future, our future, and the future of those who are not there yet. It is important that art and science talk to each other and reinforce each other 
to share the different kinds of knowledge. And that's also why we are here, I would say. For this reason, it's cru crucial that the AVICA Academy, Academy van Kunsten in Dutch, um, uh, takes part in the climate sounding board group of the KNAW. In this group, scientists and artists bring together different perspectives on the climate crisis, a monthly webinar with scientific insights from different fields of science under the title Climate from All Sides, Klimaat van Alle Kanten, is a first start for this collaboration. From the Academy van Kunsten, we contribute, and Jonas said it already, to these monthly meetings under the title Climate Narratives, a series of meetings that will take place from now on. This is the first one. In the climate narratives, members and non-members of the Academy propose the climate crisis from the angle of their artistic practice in order to help create new perspectives on the climate crisis. The German neuropsychologist, I step a little bit back from what ha happened tonight, um, uh, Ernst Puppel, he said, brains are lazy by nature. Although they are well equipped to register differences, they have a natural tendency to act conservatively if they are not continu continuously and constantly challenged and stimulated. Puppel is a great advocate of collaborations between artists and scientists because they can challenge each, each other in curiosity, for example. Puppel also argues that the arts and scientists, uh, sciences are simple, simply vital to resilient, elastic dem democracies. They make people flexible and agile. A visit to a museum or theater, or an evening like this, for example, is training the plasticity of our brains. A workout that is more than necessary. We need to be better equipped to deal with unknown situations when confronted with them. So it is in everyone's interest that science and art benefit from each other's knowledges and languages. And I'm not making propaganda here only. <laughs> um, to be effective, we must also tell stories effective, effectively. The words of Suzanne Moser, an American scientist in the field of behaviors change, so, psychology, and clim psy psychology and climate, who co-wrote the IPPC climate report, resonate here. She talks about the despair of climate scientists as they clearly see the disaster unfolding. In our society, reason has priority, but this orientation does considerably, considerable damage. She argues, for, she argues for a space where facts and imagination meet and asks what would happen if we acted with a head and a heart. The Academy wants to ampl amplify what is happening identifying, putting on the agenda, researching, connecting, and disseminating, contribute and build on how things can be done differently. How can we not feel so alone? What binds us? Where can we change something? Create spaces of opportunity or perhaps opportunism, opportunism, opportunism sorry, in the good sense of the word. Where and how do we meet? Artistic and scientific freedom, inequality, climate crisis, all these things are not separate. They can only be understood in connection with each other. I see art as a verb, a process, performance, training, and as a cultural technique. An activity to turn existing knowledge against itself, to influence our ability to see, hear, feel things differently, to trust that ability to make public and to set our own conditions to ask critical questions about what stories are told, how and by whom, to imagine and practice the possibility future, poss possible futures that lie ahead and create stories that take place here, now and in the near future, and the far future as well. A model for moving forward that helps us to imagine how we will live together in a disruptive world. Disrupted world. The power of art lies in its ability to make, Im to, to make images visible and audible in all kinds of ways. The art is how we all make our forces more than the sum of their parts. Thank you. Um, I think we are going to continue. Your final thoughts on yeah. uh, culture, resilience and truth seekers. We have one minute for your, yeah. both of your last responses. Yeah. One minute. Become truth seekers, not <laughs> complainants, not, not uh, prosecutors, become truth seekers. Think outside the box and organize. That's all. Thank you, Radha. Um, 
Maybe one, one last thing. I, w I was just wondering, because you've worked on this for quite a long time, also together with your zine and everyone, eh? a couple of years. How do you feel after these feel? years? <laughs> How, How do you do feel? I feel? Yes. Oh, Are I we back in you? Are we... And oh. Jonas as well, and your relationship between you two. Um... Oh. This has been not... Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know where I found this man, but uh, <laughs> there you are. He found me, he says, but so, so it goes. But no, it has been absolutely amazing. It has been an amazing experience in a number of ways. Right. Yeah. Uh, first of all, for me... Uh, you know, who has always worked in a global South context to work in a very European context has been an amazing experience. And the love and the receptivity and, you know, everything that I have found. I've made amazing friends. Look at these people here, you know, really. I don't think this friendship is going away when the exhibition closes, right? And uh, that has been... I think I'm stuck with Jonas for a long time. That's good. So, you know, it's been very amazing. But I think what I have learned a lot, it has... I have learned a lot in terms of, you know, you, you academically, you read things and you critique and you write. I write on law and, you know, colonialism and law and imperialism and all of that. But to actually create something that people who are not lawyers can respond to. You know, I'm, it is about constitutionalism, but it's not constitutionalism. You know, it is about social contract theory, but it's not really social contract theory. So to be able to flip that law and critique of law in that way, that has been a very amazing experience. Yeah. And... Uh, Sometimes we start, we work in our own little groups or, you know, our professional identities take over our bigger identities. Where lawyers talk to lawyers, artists talk to artists, and then we start living in a bubble, you know, what you were saying about scientists talk to each other. And I think what this conversation does is helps us to break out of that bubble. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. And that has been yeah. the most uh, rewarding thing for me. Yes. Thank you. Jonas. <laughs> I fully second that. Um, my note will be, the, will be a very short note because I tend, I'm very, uh, how do you call it? I feel always very dedicated to the social contract with the public and we're moving over time. Um, but I would say that for me, what I've learned most about the collaboration with Rada, uh, and that also stuck, that struck me again tonight, is um, the performativity of everything. So now we are in an informal conversation. We are no longer in the court. There were moments when Rada was reading the verdict. We are in the court. I mean, we had the public hearings, we had the prosecution, we had the witnesses, we had the evidence. We had four judges who worked for several weeks to debate how to interpret the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act on this particular piece of evidence, on this particular testimony. On, um, so in, in, in its performance or in the moments that we, or that you were willing to share in the reading of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act, then it is as real as we want it to be. And I think the quote that Rada made, uh, or that, that the four judges made in the verdict, um, where a legal uh, researcher or professor is, is quoted saying, Speaking about legal fictions, I mean that's true, right? Like these these institutions, these narrative, they are only they are only real. They are only capable of shaping reality as long as we are willing to give our legitimacy to them. When we retract for them and we say not this court, our court, then it's as real as we act it into being. Um, and this, I think, is where the question of organization, when Rada ended and said organize. This is where it, where it comes down to. It's a question of imagination. It's also a question of organization. And to believe in imagination, not as, as, as a fiction, um, but as a, as a narrative that structures the possibility of reality. Exactly. I really want to thank Rada for your 
contribution tonight, for all, all the organizers, and for you, Hisham, for leading these beautiful conversations, for you for being willing to stay with us all along. There are um, drinks and there is food outside to continue the conversation. You're all very much invited, and hopefully we see you at the next Climate Narratives as the Society of Arts. Thank you so much. Thank you.